Folks, welcome to Draft Deeper on the No Ceilings NBA Podcast Network. I'm your host, Maxwell Baumbach. No Nathan Grubel today, but surprise, folks, Stephen Gillespie is back. He's back on the No Ceilings NBA Podcast feed, Stephen. I am so happy. I can really contain <laughs> myself. Good to have you back. How have you been? Man, Maxwell, first off, I am so happy to be back, just if I, if I may, right? So... Uh, for those who don't know, I am active duty military. So sometimes I, when I have free time, I, I do the no ceilings thing, right? But I have to go out on deployments and stuff. And when I get home, I, I call my wife. She's out at the grocery store getting me a cake because I have the best wife in the whole world, right? <laughs> Brianna, shout out if you're listening. Um, so she's out with the kids getting me a cake. I get home early. The very next thing that I do is let the no ceilings family know that I made it back. Like it's, I, I didn't call my mom. I love you, mom. If you're listening, <laughs> um, I didn't call my dad. I love you, dad. If you're, if you're listening, but um, it it's immediate family. And then it's no ceilings, man. I am so proud of the work that you guys have put in. I love the fact that everybody is already into the 2024 class and doing shows and stuff on them. It ramps me up. I'm so excited to be back, man. And I'm excited for the show tonight. Yeah, it's been so great, not just for like the dynamic and like the positivity and everything that you bring to our crew, but just like getting somebody else to bounce players off of. Like, it just makes me so happy when I get a text during the day and I'm like, oh man, Steven's diving into this guy's film. Like, <laughs> awesome. Like, are we on the same page? Do we disagree? What am I missing? Like, just having that dynamic back going, it's it's invaluable, man. Like, it's, it's so exciting. So I appreciate that, dude. We are going to get into uh, some no stone and turn stuff. So Nathan and I went through the big man uh, piece that I did. This is a series. For those that aren't uh, subscribed to the Substack, first off, shame on you. Get over there. Please do that. Come of course, on. We're on a Scotty Middleton piece. You got to you got to get over there. You want to see the Scotty I Middleton. I like some Middleton. Yeah. I do, too. I'm very, very high on Scotty Middleton. And I think Corey <laughs> is higher on him than I am. So definitely want to check out. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been doing the series. I did it last year. We're doing it again this year. No stone unturned looking at players that are um, largely out of mainstream mock drafts, top 100s, early big boards, things like that, that I see as guys that have NBA potential uh, to varying degrees. Some guys I'm like, Hey, I think this guy might get there like this year. Other guys it's, Hey, keep an eye on this one for down the road. Um, since the last episode, I've done part one and part two of the wing group. So I do three groups mm -hmm. of wings. At the end of this episode, I'll, I'll reveal the next five wings as well. I uh, already got some interviews in the bag. Love part three. Part three mm. is my favorite. I'm going to not not to, to like dump on any of these wings. I think part three is my favorite group overall. But okay. uh, we're going to start off with part one of the wing group. So in this group, we have Michael Bell, uh, who's going to be playing at VCU. We have Wesley Cardett Jr. at Chicago State. We have RJ Lewis, who will be at St. John's. We have Darian Williams, who will be at Texas Tech. And we have Rashir Fleming at St. Joseph's. Steven, I'm going to throw it to you because people, mm. a lot of people probably read the column already. They know my takes on these guys. Out of these five players, who do you think has the most potential to hear their name called on draft night in 2024? Man, so I, first off, it, it makes me feel good whenever you make a list of players that are like these no stones unturned. And I look back in my previous boards and I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh, I have like a lot of these dudes in, on, on my board. So that makes me mm -hmm. feel good about myself. But <laughs> man, you put me onto this Michael Bell kid and yeah. uh, dude, he is something special, you know, freshman coming into VCU. Um, I, I love his game so much, man. Like he is going to be kind of like in that slightly after lottery range, probably on, on my board. I, I like him a great bit. Sheesh. So for those uh, unaware, Michael Bell is a freshman. Um, he's going to be around 20 years old by the time draft time rolls around. He played in the Esquad League last season. And if you look mm -hmm. at his statistics, they are pretty comparable to what Bilal Koulibaly did in that league last year. So Bilal was a little bit more productive. Um, Bilal was also younger uh, and mm -hmm. Bilal also managed to carve out an actual role on like his, his, his big boy club team, like, uh, you know, on the, on the main roster, not just in the 21 and under league in France. So 
Um, Michael Bell in the Espoir League averaged 17 points per game, nine rebounds, 3.1 assists to 3.2 turnovers, 2.2 steals per game, and half a block. He had 56.3, 45.5, and 62.4 shooting splits. Um, he is super athletic. He's kind of another guy in like this game wrecker mold where like mm -hmm. a phenomenal defensive playmaker really athletic, very quick, can jump, but then also has that sort of inherent feel to his game on both sides of the court. Like defensively, he's got this nose for the ball. He can really cover ground. He can see things and then get there really quickly. And then on offense, he he can put it on the floor a little bit. He has ways to get to the rim. He gets to the free throw line a ton. He can see the floor well. He's a great grab and go player. Like sort of like a little bit of Andre Jackson in a sense, but like a mm -hmm willing outside shooter um but sort of in a in a similar vein not the passer that andre jackson is but um sort of that same vein so yeah so what were your kind of big takeaways on on michael bell yeah man so looking at my notes you know i, I love his body control like I'm, I'm focusing in on his offense a lot because i i see the defensive stuff that you're talking about right like he is very versatile on that end of the floor but if you if I had no idea who he was, like after like you putting me on him doing my own research and I just turned on the film first, I would think that this guy's main pathway to the NBA would be his offense and his and his penetration ability because he's pretty mm -hmm. slippery with the ball, man. Like he has yeah. a nose for the bucket, as you said, um, can contort his body, shields the ball very well against the defense. I just my biggest thing with him. Speaking of the Andre Jackson comparison is like, how good is a shot? You know yep. what I mean? Is, yeah. is the shot there? And can he like attack left on a consistent basis? Because he's pretty like one dimensional in the way that he drives. But I mm -hmm. love the fact that he committed to VCU. I think that that is like a hand and glove pairing with his immediate skill set. And I think that he's going to have an opportunity to grow offensively playing that American style ball and going up against that consistent level of play. Um, you know, game in and game out. Like in a weird way, he's kind of taking a step down in competition, but it's a different mm -hmm. style. So growing accustomed to that new yeah. style is going to be like his biggest hurdle that I can see. But based on everything that I've like researched about this guy, I don't think that he's going to rest on his laurels very, um, very much, if at all. Yeah. It, so let's let's talk about the shot a little bit because you mentioned the shot. Yeah. And if you're just like listening to this, you're not like pulling up the real GM page for Michael Bell. And you're like, I thought you said he shot 45% from three. Okay. Well, yeah. he, he did, <laughs> but it's, it's, both of us are very tentative. The shot looks different every time. Like sometimes mm -hmm. it's like what I call like the shack release where like he doesn't follow all the way through. Sometimes it almost looks like he's shooting with two hands. Sometimes there's mm -hmm. significant drift. Uh, he's got like a weird, like, like, push to the center with like yes. his, the insides of his hands. It's yeah, really funky. It looks like a, yeah. like a two handed push shot at times. It's, mm -hmm. it's really odd, but then other times like it, it, it just looks good. Like sometimes I, I don't know. It's, it's very bizarre and it's very inconsistent. Um, so we shot, yeah, he shoots 45% from three this year on two attempts per game in the spot. Yeah. Um, in prior years, he was 21% and 25%. And free throw shooting is not like the be-all, end-all, but he's never been above 70% from the free throw yeah. line. So it's just like, it's really hard to buy this as anything other than like a giant shot variance uptick. And like if he took, you know, more than like 60 attempts or whatever it was in total in the Espa League last season, it feels like he'd probably be like a 32% three point shooter. You know what I mean? Like, so it's just like, yeah. all right, well then if he's that, you know, all the other stuff is there. Like he's got everything else you'd want. And then be a player from a, a physical athleticism standpoint, a feel standpoint, uh, you know, obviously defensively, he makes a ton of plays. Um, it's just a matter of like, can he get teams to respect him on the perimeter? Um, so that's like kind of my pause with him. Like he's, yep a guy that is just like sitting like just outside of 60 for me, because I want, I just want to see it on a college court. And I think, yeah, I think the fail rate here is really low. Like I, I get nervous with these guys, right? Cause like when you're talking about guys mm -hmm. that are, are coming from, you know, there, a lot of these guys are transferring to bigger programs or like they're in this case coming from an international league. It can be hard to project, but it feels like the fail rate with bell is going to be low just because he's that big and that athletic and he knows how to play defense. 
and he knows how to pass. So like, how bad is he going to be in that league? Like, I, I don't see a world where he's not like a starter or at least like the sixth man for VCU next year. And then he's got four years of eligibility after that. So if I may, when I say lottery, I've reviewed like in detail, you know, 35 new players. I haven't even gone through my returners yet. So when I said, I said post lottery because of where he is on my board right now, he's like 17th of 35. But yep, still, that that's in like me earlier. Mm-hmm. that's in like really good company with yeah, the, yeah. the rest of the players. Like I'm very confident in him, and I think even when I go through my returners, I'm probably gonna have him somewhere in that like early second to middle second round coming in because I do value him a lot, and I I think that he is um you know he's got so much maturity to his game already because of the pro experience it's again mm-hmm. just growing more accustomed to that american style of play which i think isn't even going to be that hard because he does a lot of you know drive penetration um like i said he just his footwork around the basket needs a little bit of improvement but he does some nifty things with the ball in his hands mm-hmm. like again he can kind of do some up and under some euro steps and stuff like that it's just it's it's mostly right-handed finishing and he relies on his athleticism a lot. So can he use that slipperiness that he does possess and and do a little bit more versatility around the basket? That's kind of where I'm at with him offensively. Yeah, I think I'm I'm a little bit more bullish on him as like a two hand, like a in terms of like the finishing with each hand kind of thing. Like I okay, I do think he's had some nice flashes there. A lot of it is in transition, so I don't know. You know what I mean? Like yeah, eh, like is that something that like is going to show up in the half court? I don't know. I'm optimistic. I'm choosing to buy it. I understand you not because <laughs> I like them a lot, man. Yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. Like that particular nits. element, which is exactly small thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But yeah, like we just keep like it just keeps circling back to like the big picture stuff here is awesome. Like to have a guy yes. that moves like this and knows how to play, and with him having four years of eligibility, I, 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 I kind of feel like it's if not when with him or like when not if rather. Yeah. Yeah. When not if so. I think he's going to get there. I do think there's a real chance he comes out and just wrecks everybody. I think there is some chance that like, he's just a little erratic as he settles into this style of play and that maybe he doesn't have a great year, but I like him. I think he's definitely a guy to be monitoring. He will, he was my favorite out of this group as well. So who For is, sure. who is your next guy in the, the part, the part one batch? So I think that this is probably going to be a little bit surprising because when we were talking mm-hmm. about these players, we were just like, yeah, we'll focus on a couple and the kids <laughs> kind of, kind of breeze through some mm-hmm. and Darian Williams out of Nevada now going to Texas tech. I watched all their film right in, in preparation for the show. And I just could not quit Darian Williams because he kind of gives you some of that, like Jalen Slauson, um, you know, they're, that kind of Swiss army knife player, but he's got the jump shot like yep. off the dribble, you know, which kind of propels you into the front of the crowd, so to speak. And when I'm watching him play, like he, he can spot up, he can shoot off the dribble. Uh, the Texas tech fit. I like a lot because they typically do find like one or two of these kind of like do it all players, but mm-hmm. the shots not really there. It feels like his is, and I think leveling up, you know, playing with Texas Tech, I think that that's going to help him out a lot. Uh, He has really good vision too, although it is more kind of simplistic. You know, he's not going to make those like cross-court reads or anything like that, but he makes smart plays. I don't think, I don't really ever see him rushing into a bad decision when I watch him play. And then defensively, I just, he, I'm not in love with his closeouts. You know what I mean? Like that's like he, whenever Whenever he kind of has to like hit that next gear on the other side of on the defense, he he leaves a lot to be desired. So hopefully transitioning to Texas Tech where it is a lot of up and down play and they do like their defenders in Texas Tech. Right. So I think that that's a good fit um, philosophically. Hopefully he can capitalize on the on the move. Yes, yeah, so I think we are more similar in terms of how we see him than mm-hmm. maybe where like our immediate projections for him are. So with Darian Williams, like you said, the feel and like decision making is outstanding. So he was the only player who in their freshman season. Okay, so since 20 okay, Yes. I'm gonna start over. Since 2013, only one player who is six six or taller had a three to one assist to turnover ratio during their first college season. It's Lonzo Ball and Darian Williams. And that's it. So we were talking about Pretty a guy who can, can really sling the ball 
and really make sure to limit his mistakes at the same time. So the passing, the feel is tremendous. Like you said, it's not a lot of like crazy advanced reads. It's just very sharp deliveries yep. and very quick processing ability. Just seeing things the moment they pop up and getting the ball there. There's a little bit of like, it's not creativity in terms of the reads. Cause I, I think you're spot on there, but it's more like being clever about how to get the ball to certain spots, exactly. like knowing the right type of pass to throw, putting a, a bit of a spin or an angle on a, on an interior pass, things like that to, to get it where it needs to go. Um, He's a real deal, like connector, like the phrase, mm-hmm. like connector gets thrown around all the time. Like he is that, um, I do think he's a good shooter. I think he needs to shoot more. Um, sure. Right now he's a little tentative. Like the volume per 100, I think is like five, five, three attempts per 100. Like he's just got to take more threes and he can make them like really the good. Shot on looks one great guard. too. Yeah. 40.2% on his catch and shoot threes. Um, I remember, I believe I remember diving like some of his high school and like AU numbers and those being good also. Like, it's not Mm -hmm. like, oh, he just had like a good shoot here. Like I, I genuinely believe he can, he can really shoot the ball. He's just got to, got to take more of them. Um, given kind of where he's at athletically. Yeah. Defensively, like you said, like the closeouts and that extra gear is missing. Like he's just not, he's not athletic. Like he's, he's ground bound. He's not very quick. He's strong at six foot six. He knows how to use his body. He'll throw it on people. And he makes all these plays because he has a great nose for the ball. He he's thinking three steps ahead. Um, as far as what's going on, he knows the opposing offense, knows the scouting report. It's just going to be, it's the ultimate case of like feel versus athleticism and like how mm-hmm. far could being the smartest man on the court take you? Cause he <laughs> is most nights. Like he is the smartest player on the basketball court. The issue is just like, he, he's not taking a ton of threes. He's a little bit passive. He can't finish inside because he doesn't jump and he's not very quick. So he doesn't get inside very quickly. Um, and then if you're not getting inside, how translatable is the passing going to be and how much is the field going to carry over defensively? If he's, you know, not improving athletically and he's a step slow and a little bit ground bound, like who's he guarding at the NBA there, there's a world where just like he, he's just this, right? Like he's this stellar yeah. college role player. Um, but I do think if there is like any sort of athletic jump, he's going to find a way. So for me, like I'm viewing him through kind of a four year lens. I know a lot of, a lot of people I've talked to are, are in kind of in your camp and are really optimistic about him maybe making a jump sooner than you might think heading into a bigger program, getting those resources. I just, I see him more long-term and I'm a little bit skeptical. I, so I wouldn't be surprised if it takes him a little bit. Right. But when I'm looking at this group and I'm, I'm looking at the skill set that, that exists today and I'm like, okay, if everyone kind of hits their idealized version of themselves, mm-hmm. I think that in, in my honest opinion, like the way that he processes the game, like the way we keep repeating, you know, that the way that he he sees the game so well and has that innate feel. And if we're noticing the trend in the NBA, it's that feel kind of trumps athleticism feel in size, a lot of ways, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, and he's got the ball handling there. He's got the vision. I I'm a little bit more bullish, I think, on the way that the finishing is going to work. And I think that the defense will improve, too, because how many times do we see, like, the one guy that has to do everything on offense, Mm -hmm. like, is usually the one that kind of has to take a little bit of a beat on the other side of the ball. So hopefully the move to Texas Tech kind of helps him with that. I think if any program is going to help him get up and down the court on a consistent basis and push him to his max athletically, like, Texas Tech might be on that short list, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So who do you have uh, third out of this camp? Our boy. And I heard you talk about him with uh, Spence when he mm-hmm. came on on the show. And he even gave him a little stamp of approval, too. But that's uh, Chicago State's Wesley Cardet Jr., man. I am, mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of this, man. First off, I say I'm a big fan. He's a big man on the court. Like, if you just – if you're putting on a, a Chicago State game and you never watched it before – don't even don't even look up the jersey number or anything. Just look for the guy who looks like he could be in the NBA. That's Wesley Cardet. Yeah. Like he's, he's yeah. easily identifiable on the court. He runs the floor very well. I'm a big fan of like his little creation stuff that he showed yeah, last yeah. year. I, I think that, you know, he kind of does a little hostage dribble, which is very fun. Like he again, ball shielding is very much in vogue in, in the NBA, right? So um 
his mid range game, he can get to the mid range shot. What do you think about the jumper? Because it looks like it's like multifaceted. It's very much like paint by numbers almost where it's like, all right, one, two, three, let it go. You know, it's like very kind of mechanical, but not in like the smoothest way. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little torn. I want to buy yeah. it. Um, so, uh, let, so, okay. So let's go back to kind of square one with Cardet, and then we'll, we'll get into the sure. jumper. So, uh, plays at Chicago state, which like in and of itself deserves explanation. Chicago state was to be frank, a garbage tier program in college basketball. Uh, they had a season during the COVID year where they were and nine and then they were like, we quit. <laughs> like they just like stopped we're, playing we don't play anymore. They legit like just shut down the season so they bring this coach gerald gillian who has like this really strong like uh high school uh coaching track record he was an assistant at sanford uh sanford rather they bring him in and like pretty immediate turnaround like uses those connections in florida gets a guy like wesley cardet to, to transfer over gets other like good recruits out of Florida. Now they're getting the Bewley twins, which is mm. nuts. Like yep. former five stars that are six foot nine and athletic. Um, Chicago state is not in a conference. So like they have to play almost all of their games on the road. Uh, they have to play a lot of really good teams. Like it's, they, they play a lot of like small, like mid to low major schools that you would typically associate with like a Chicago state, but they also have to like just randomly play Gonzaga in the middle of March and stuff like yeah. that. It's, it's a weird, <laughs> weird place to be. And I think because of it, like it's kind of a good like iron sharpens iron type deal for a guy like Cardat. Like that, yeah. Um, but yeah, Cardat had uh 16.6 points per game, five rebounds per game, three assists per game, uh, 1.0 steals, 0.6 blocks, 45% from the field, 34.4% from three, 81.3% from the free throw line. So with the shot, solid percentage. Um, yeah, shot difficulty is pretty tough. Um mm-hmm doesn't get a lot of unguarded ones takes a lot of threes off the dribble actually yep. um kind of because of his role is a guy who's a primary creator a lot of the time um i do think the shot looks better um mm-hmm. he's more comfortable pulling up with it and it's something that he's been drilling a lot so i I'm with you that I'm not like sold on it. And that's, that's the one reason I didn't go top 60 on him. And I think I I said, I think I said, I've got him like top 75 or somewhere like that. Like he's for sure a guy that is like in the mix. If he comes out probably worthy of a two way or, you know, at least an exhibit 10, something like that. If all stays the same. Um, But yeah, like it's, it's really tough because if you're six foot six, you you really got to shoot it. And if it is a little bit clunky on the mechanical side, and like the volume isn't crazy. Like it's good, but not great. I, I can't get like two over my skis, even though the rest of his game is like really well-rounded. The passing, like you mentioned, is really intriguing. You can tell yep. he was a combo guard growing up. Um, and defensively, like he really competes, like he yes. really brings it on defense for a guy who is the offense. Like he's the leading man on the offensive side. And he has to play like 38 minutes a game because this is not a team that has established a lot of depth yet. Uh, but yeah, he's still out there uh, getting after it. So I like the physical tools. Like you said, I, I like the body. He looks like an NBA player. Yes, he it's does. Just, can, Moves he, like one. can he shoot it like an NBA player? It's just like the one kind of hang up that I have with him. And I think he's got to reel in the decision-making a bit, but I think it's also a classic, like the decision-making will be better when he has the ball less kind yes. of a thing. Like the, he's just a little overextended in this current role. And that's what we want to see from guys who we know are probably going to project to be role players. It's like, okay, they have done a lot within their role and now they know what the the stars that they're going to be playing next to are looking for because they Mm -hmm. themselves were looking for it, right? So it's easily identifiable to a guy like Wesley Cardet. And I just think too, man, like that you you mentioned his defense. I'm a big fan of it. I think that as he kind of grows and matures within the system, uh, the the mistakes that he makes will go down. You know, he's hard to move off his spot. So when he's sticking to you, you are, you're not getting rid of him. Um, But he tends to fall for the stuff that, you know, most young basketball players fall for. And I think when he kind of sees these things and he has now a full off season within the program to kind of like grow, get better, develop chemistry, kind of understand, okay, this is what people are going to be looking for me to do on scouting reports. And like, how do I counter these things? Now he's learning how to, 
think the game of basketball a little bit better as opposed to just going out there and doing basketball. So I'm a big fan of him. I would like to see him come out, but Maxwell, I think that I don't know how you feel about it. I would also not be surprised to see him have a really strong year and then kind of like maybe transfer up. You know, I do like the loyalty that he's yeah. showing to a Chicago state, mm-hmm. but what are we seeing with a guy like Dylan Jones that we were right? Like, yeah, he, he might be loyal to, to a school like Dylan mm-hmm. Jones was, even though he like turned heads, but mm-hmm. he might come back and like stick it through like what Dylan Jones is doing now, or he might see kind of that situation and say, okay, if I don't want to do the whole super senior route, maybe mm-hmm. I, you know, transfer up and answer some of those questions. I could see it. He did. He did transfer once already. So I do wonder yeah. if like with the NCAA, like cracking down on that, if that would affect things at all. But I yeah. also wonder like, so they got the Bewley twins in there. So it's like, we're really bringing in talent. That's true. Yeah. And I know that at least in other sports, Chicago state is a horizon league member. Mm-hmm. So it's like, is the horizon league just going to be like, Hey, next year you're in. And then at that point, is it like, Hey, we've got stability. We play enough real teams. Yeah. Like just stay here. Okay. Like, that is, that is possible. So we'll see. We're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to hit these last two guys in this group. And then we'll move on to, part three because there's one guy that you haven't brought up yet that a lot of people are really into so we're going to kind of like him too yeah yeah so we're gonna have that that debate in just a second uh so stay tuned we will be right back all right so who is next on your list it's the guy. It's our boy, RJ Lewis, who is now going to St. John's. Um, listen, I like him a lot. Now, out of the groups of five that we're going to be talking about, like, mm-hmm. I I love this first group, man. Like, and I, I think do. how I see Darian Williams kind of, like, shows the the depth of it. But RJ Lewis is, is as real as it gets, man. Like, he's got a wet jumper, a confident shooter, a solid handle. I wouldn't say you're not looking for him to be a lead guard, you know, so to speak, but mm-hmm. that one of these like secondary tertiary options that you feel confident um in in your backcourt he's good at moving um around screens i love his like offensive screen navigation if i can phrase it that way he is so good at reading what his teammates are doing he is very deceptive with his upper body and and lower body too on how he's selling the defense on where he wants them to think that he's going but then he'll jet the other way and, and just get himself open you know that that kind of screen gravity that he has is is amazing. Um, he's not super strong, has a tendency to get bumped off his spots a little bit, but hopefully a good strong offseason and you know transferring up to the St. John's program probably help him out a little bit in that regard. Um, and he also like most good jump shooters, you know they have a tendency to kind of fall in love with that jumper a little bit. I want to see him be a little bit more aggressive with the ball. But St. John's looks like they're going to be really good this year, so maybe he can be a little bit more perimeter prone and get away with it he's not like a super plus athlete but he is very good, deceptive yeah. too yeah where mm-hmm. you're like okay like he's just like this dude who's gonna run run around screens all day he doesn't have much going on in the athletic department he can kind of sneak up on you a little bit um i like him i like the way that he gambles a little bit on defense because he seems to do it in like the best of ways mm-hmm. but you kind of wonder like does that habit transferring up in levels of competition, will that kind of nip him or bite him in the butt a little bit, you know, bites on pump fakes, things of that nature. And uh, again, I, I love the move to St. John's man. I think that move, him moving up kind of proving himself a little bit is a, is a great move for him. I'm excited to see that program him in particular. For sure. Yeah. That program's going to be fascinating because there's just like a lot of new players in the mix yes. and a lot of good players. And it's just mm-hmm. like, all right, somebody's going to get squeezed. Are there going to be issues? Is this team just going to steamroll everybody? Like, Patino's an excellent coach. So, like, yeah. his teams always punch above their weight. Like, there's a real possibility they just destroy everybody. I don't know what to expect. Uh, so, RJ is the guy that I think probably is the most buzz out of mm-hmm. anybody that I've, like, written about so far. So, I've, I just stunk. So, I, I try to avoid guys here on mainstream mocks. And, like, I it started the piece. Like I'd reach out to St. John's, whatever we couldn't, couldn't get it to work interview wise, which like not their fault. They did. They sure. tried to make it work and it just timing schedules, a lot going on. Uh, and then Wa- Jonathan Wasserman from Bleacher Report had him in his mock draft. And I was like, Oh man, like it's too late. It's too late. I, I already told the school he's in the column. I can't take him out. Uh, but yeah, Wasser- I think Wasserman was probably one of the best, like of like the mainstream people, like 
best guys as far as like the fringe and margin guys, like his second round throughout the year, he was really early on a lot of guys. So I think that is worth something. Um, yeah, yeah really, really good offensive playmaker, uh, RJ Lewis. So on pick and roll possessions, uh, including passes last year, he was in the 87th percentile for synergy. Jeez. Just really knows how to get his own. Like, like you mentioned, there's the real herky jerky knows how to navigate a screen very difficult to read there's so much like rock rhythm footwork pace like it's it's all there and then he's so long that like he's got this soft touch at the basket and can get good angles at the rim he's he's really good there um great finisher gets the free throw line a ton too uh and a really good free throw shooter so um yeah almost 80 percent from the free throw line like you mentioned the jumper really nice off the pull up 38.5 on dribble jumpers inside the arc in the half court which is a good number like a lot like it sounds low like oh 38 percent on like a shot that's two it's like for pull-up jumpers in college and like a lead role that's really solid that's a good mark uh, especially for a freshman um and then yeah the defensive playmaking is is great almost a three uh steal rate of three 1.5 block rate for me, it comes down to the shot, which like it's this is good the case for a lot of these guys, right? But yeah, he didn't take a lot of threes at all. Um, took 4.2 threes per 100, made him at a 34.8% clip. And like sometimes it's a moon ball, like it just doesn't look great all the time, but he hits it at the free throw line. He hits yep. this pull up. So it's like if he just, he's just got to take more of them. And like I think even more so than Cardette, because I think athletically he's a little bit ahead of Cardette. Um, you think so? He, you think he's more athletic? It's different than- types of athleticism. I think, yeah. I think Lewis is like faster and more fluid where I think yeah, Cardet's more, stronger. Yeah. like, I think if you, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's fair though. Cause I think if you threw him like in an NBA game tomorrow, like Lewis might get bumped off his spot a ton and like guys might drive through him where with Cardet, it's like, he might be a little slow on some wings, but like, yeah, I, I don't think he like physically, he it's like get bossed around. It's like comparing Malik Monk to, you know, OG Ananobi. Yes. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Both good athletes. And yeah, like when you said that, I was like, wait, he's stronger. But yeah, you're right. He's faster. Yeah, it's different, completely different types of athleticism. I think, yeah, I think to your point, I think Wesley Cardet has a more NBA ready body right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think with Lewis, it's just a matter of like take more threes make more threes and if he does that then he's golden but if not like i think the fit is a little bit trickier than it is for cardat because i think with cardat it's mm-hmm. like oh yeah he'll like take catch and shoot threes where with lewis he's a little gun shy he's a little bit tentative and it's like okay well how many guys are there that are wing players that are like slow on the draw and hesitant about shooting threes and like to just put it on the floor a lot and like operate out of the mid range and and get to the basket. And how easy is it going to be to get to the basket when you don't have the threat of that jump shot? So like, I I think there are paths where it can be really tough for him. Um, But I do think if that shot goes like this guy is going to rock it on my board. That's weird that we're like, I feel like in a lot of ways we're seeing the same guy, but like, I, I look at the jumper, man, especially like you're mentioning, like his pull up and the way that he mm-hmm. kind of like gets into it and steps in. I'm I'm not as worried with the okay. jumper. I think that the jumper is going to be there. And I don't know, maybe it's the I don't know. Maybe it was like as the season went went on, I was feeling like he was a little he bit got more better confident. at everything. Yeah. Yeah. As the season yeah. went on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, looking at it, you know, if we like kind of take where he ended and kind of like prorate that out a little bit, I don't know, like. I'm going to have to go back and look at that a little bit more because Mm -hmm. if you're saying that, then I'm like, okay, maybe I need to reevaluate this stuff. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited for him though. Mm -hmm. I I think that um, he's very intriguing and I definitely understand why there's a lot of us surrounding his name. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I just think it's, it's tough because it's a new situation. It's a better conference. And it's also just like a lot of mouths to feed on that team. Like you've just got so many guys between like Soriano's back. Jordan Dingle's really good. Like there's just a lot of players. So We'll see. Uh, last guy on the list is kind of like I included basically one of the I'm basically including one of these guys in each wing grouping where it's like a guy that I watched and like maybe the production's not all the way there, but it's like I just love this guy. I'm including him. And it's Rashir Fleming from St. Joseph, yeah. six foot nine, uh, six around six points per game, five rebounds per game, uh, point one assists to one point one turnovers, not ideal, but point nine steals and point eight blocks per game. 
Um, 42.7% from the field, 29.7% from three, 69% from the free throw line. If you find, if you watch his best games and yep. really squint, there's a little bit of Taylor Hendricks in there, which I realize is a massive stretch, <laughs> right? Like this is like, I'm, I'm taking a rubber band and pulling it as far as it can go. Uh, this is platinum lining. This is a silver. <laughs> yeah. So this is a guy who's six foot nine. He's really mobile. He makes a ton of plays on the defensive side of the floor. And I do think he's going to shoot it. Like he's a guy mm-hmm. where I look at the shot and I'm like, that looks good. Looks the same every time the release is high. Doesn't take him very long to get it off. Um, one of those guys where just kind of like a weird career trajectory. Like one of these new, you're seeing it more now that there's like more and more of these like big prep academies and stuff like that played at Camden where he was on a team with uh, Bradshaw and Juan Wagner, where he's mm-hmm. never been the guy. Um, so it just kind of feels like there's a pretty big runway on what he can become as he continues to grow into this game. Uh, rebounds really well, but basically just a six foot nine guy that can really play defense and has a chance to shoot. Connective yeah. tissue, eh, not really there, but any any Rashir Fleming thoughts? Because he's kind of my like stab in the dark out of, out of this. Yeah. Game. So I, I can see where you get like the whole stab in the dark. And like, if you look like there's a real player in there, uh, he's got a really big body, man. Like he, he, he fits the kind of like, if you're going to carve out an NBA player out of a rock, like that's what Rashard Fleming looks like. Um, he, he plays kind of like the, the big position. Um, mm-hmm. And it reminded me so much of like a Vince Williams Jr. Where it's like, okay, this Ooh. is a wing but he's playing like a lot of four and a lot of five and some lineups, right? Um, he's very powerful. He's not afraid to shoot. I, I think the consistency is like the big thing. Like the shot itself, the mechanics look right. It's just like getting it to fall and like it, like the, like it sprays in different spots. You know what I mean? So like yeah. uh, finding the consistency on that end, he's really good on the glass. So I love his effort competes hard. Um, kind of stiff and upright on defense. So I think that he mm-hmm. kind of needs to improve a little bit in that regard, but I really like him defending the post. So I see why he plays like the the four and the five for his team, but I don't know, man, like I wasn't tracking him when I said that I feel good about the names that I have on the list and I appreciate you putting me on some <laughs> like Richard yeah. Fleming being on the list is definitely a nice dad, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was, he was in Nathan call too. So Nathan was like, Hey, oh, check wow. him out for the series. And then I did. And I was like, Oh, I love this guy. I love that. He's six foot nine. I love that. He's 220 pounds. Yep. I, do, I do think he's going to shoot it, but I, I still worry. Like, even if he does the connective tissue stuff, like you said, he's got to be a little bit looser defensively as well. So um, we are going to throw it to another quick break. When we do, we're going to be back with part two of our wing group uh timing is also awesome because my daughter is getting her final diaper change right before bed (laughs) as we go into this so you may hear her a little bit when we come back after the break too so we'll be back here in just a second all right so let's get into uh part two um so in this column we have brandon johnson from east carolina we have zach austin uh, from Pittsburgh, Cade Tyson from Belmont. Uh, we've got Andrew Road at Virginia. Rody, I, I Road. I hear both pronunciations. I've heard Road. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got uh, Cedric Coward from Eastern Washington. So Stephen, lead the charge. Who do you want to cover first in this group? Can we talk some Cade Tyson, please? Ooh, like, uh, all I, right, I, I, that's a curveball, but I like it. I, I like me some Cade Tyson, man. A very fun shooter, uh, repeatable motion. Uh, can be, again, you know, like most good jump shooters, a little bit reliant on the jumper. Uh, has a nice float game, so good soft touch around the basket. Um, and he's he's got good connective ability. You know, teammate, you know, of a former favorite, you know, still favorite, right? But a yeah. uh, guy who we, uh, who you put everybody on and Ben Shepard, right? So, mm-hmm. Um, taking the reins over from him is going to be fun to see. Uh, he's competitive, right? But he's one of these like typical, like, um, you know, white college players that you see come in. <laughs> it's like, okay, he's a scrapper, but like, yeah. how does the athleticism translate? Right. So luckily yeah. for him, he's got the the wing size to mm-hmm. go along with that. I just, I'm in love with this dude as like a movement shooter, man. He, he looks so good. 
Yeah, he can really shoot the cover off the ball. So Cade Tyson, uh, six foot seven, he's going to be a sophomore next season. Uh, was the second leading scorer on Belmont last year as a freshman, thirteen point six points per game. Good rebounder, good awareness on defense, really good shooting splits last season. So forty nine percent from the field, forty one point seven percent from three on good volume, and forty five or an eighty five point nine percent at the free throw line. Uh, brother of Hunter Tyson, who I believe is a 37th pick in the last draft. Um, but really just puts the ball in the basket, like straight up. So there were only three other freshmen that met like his shooting split threshold last season that also took over hundred threes. It's Kay Tyson, Alex Caravan, Grady Dick, Bryce Sensabaugh. So it's all just like dudes that really can score. Yeah. So that is pretty elite company as far as putting the ball in the bucket and caravan, obviously a little bit longer, a little bit more mobile, um, Mm -hmm. probably got a little bit more passing stuff to him. So he's the guy that you're seeing kind of pop up on mock drafts already. Whereas Cade, I think that stuff still kind of got to develop, but caravans also, I believe 21 already turns 22 this season. So very old for a freshman. Um, nevertheless, Cade Tyson, excellent shooter, 57.4% on uncontested threes last (laughs) season. Like you just can't, you can't leave him open. Uh, but I, I talked to, uh, the Belmont head coach, Casey Alexander, and something he pointed out is just like, can't really chase him off the line. Like he's, he's mm. really good at the basket, very good mid post game, tremendous mid range shooter, uh, made mm-hmm. 40% of his pull up twos, very powerful, like made 58.3% of his shots at the basket and like not the most explosive, but not totally ground bound either. Like had some dunks yeah. in the half court last year, like. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give him the classic white guy, sneaky athletic label, <laughs> sneaky athletic, but he's yeah. not like a horrible athlete. And I think that yeah. the, like Hunter Tyson was a guy last year and I hate, I hate doing like compare a guy to a sibling thing, but like mm-hmm. Hunter, like, I hated Hunter Tyson's feet on defense last season. Yeah. And then like he starts like the combine circuit, and whatever. And it's like, all of a sudden he's just like moving a lot better. Like he's sliding better. He's jumping a little bit. Like some guys just need time to kind of figure that stuff out athletically. And I think with Cade, the pro projection is going to break down to like, when is that going to happen? And I don't think it needs yeah. to happen now. And I don't think he needs to put that pressure on himself or feel that pressure. Um, but I think that's going to be kind of what does it. But to your point too, like really knows how to play a complimentary role. Did a great job playing off of Ben Shepard last year. Like the yeah. role player stuff is in there. It's just a matter of getting more athletic, figuring out like who exactly does he guard at the next level? Like, can he be a full-time four? Does he have the strength and like defensive yeah. awareness to do that kind of stuff? Or is he a guy who has to like slim down and play the three uh, and get quicker? So th- it, there's some stuff to figure out, but like, I think he is like 100% a real like long-term NBA prospect, which is why I included him. And I think too, man, that like what I see defensively is like, he's obviously not going to be like, let me pick up every, you know, in the NBA, let me pick Mm -hmm. up the best assignment. But I think he's mobile enough and he's got good enough size to where it's like kind of the JJ Reddit thing, right? Like, yeah, let's put him on like the worst perimeter guy. (laughs) Yeah. Help out around and, you know, maybe place it, maybe be a little bit more, you know, gambling in the passing lane, stuff like that. Um, Be the first guy across the half court in a transition type guy, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I, I just, I like him a lot, man, out of this group. Um, I was expecting to to like him a little bit less just mm-hmm. because, you know, like you, you look at you look at him, you read the numbers, you read the profile. It's like, OK, like I've seen this a million times and then you put on <laughs> the film and it's just like, mm-hmm. OK, like this this dude's got some got some got some stuff to his game. Yeah. And like with the way that Belmont plays, too, I think like, yeah, they've sneaky put together a really good like in terms of mid-major schools where there's like a pretty like direct, like this is how an NBA offense runs kind of system. Like it's, it's pretty similar. Like there's a lot of pro functionality to what he does. He's moving into a lot of these shots. He's Mm -hmm. screening a lot. Like he's doing the things that shooting wings do. A Um, lot of options from multiple positions on offense where it's like a, a lot of, a lot of movement off and away from the ball too. And I think that whenever we're talking about him playing off of a guy like Ben Shepard, obviously Ben Shepard was, was freaking amazing, right? Like mm-hmm. did a really great job. But when I, when I'm watching him play next to Shepard, it's not like I'm deferring to you out of like fear of my own abilities. It's like, 
this is what's best for the team. But when my, when, when my number is called, like I am ready to step up and like, that's mm-hmm. a huge boost to a team and what, especially with the skill set that he has. For sure. And I, I also thought it was really interesting. Like whenever you get to talk to a coach about a kid, you can kind of get a sense for like, does the coach believe in this kid or not? Like it kind of comes yeah. through and like, I kind of bite my tongue in cases where it's like, <laughs> Oh, I don't, I think this coach is just doing this interview because the comms guy asked him to Smart. But with like, yeah, but yeah, but, K, but Casey Alexander, <laughs> like he, it seemed like he really likes Hunter Tyson. Like he kept talking about like, this kid competes so hard. Like his spirit yeah. is awesome. Like, and like, I, I thought it was great too. I like, he kept making comments. That like he's confident because he earns it every day. Like he earns exactly. that level of confidence he has in his game. So like just from an intangible, like head on straight standpoint, it seems like all that stuff is really there for him, uh, which is, which is big. So I, I think he's a guy that is going to get there and, and kind of figure the rest of that stuff out. No, man, for sure. For sure. So, I like, I like him a lot. So let's go to your uh, your number two guy on this list. I won't go to my number two, but what I'll do is I'll go to a guy who's probably one of the more recognizable guys okay. in the name and a, and, a, mm-hmm. and a guy who I watched play live last year yeah. when I scouted Taylor Hendricks, and that's uh, Brandon Johnson out of ECU. Yeah, um, so you got to see him up close, and he was a guy I remember like texting with you about during the yeah. season last year. So he's a guy that we've kind of been monitoring for a little bit. What what are your feelings about him as a player? And like, what did you see when you saw him up close? Cause I, I have not had that the chance to do. Yeah. That. So I think that again, when you kind of look at the profile and when you see some of the numbers, like you have an expectation in your head on like how this guy is supposed to play. Um, and I think that he does play that way. Like I'm, I'm actually a little bit lower on him coming mm-hmm. into this year than For I sure. was um, last season. And it's because you know, he's got great length. He's got a good looking shot. It's just that, especially in like the bigger games, he kind of shrank. He you did. know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it is and watching it up close to like gives me probably almost too much of a bad taste in my mouth because mm-hmm. I might be kind of anchoring myself to that performance. And again, he played against a top 10 player uh, yeah. or top 10 draft pick in a really good draft last year. But um there's a lot of things to like, though. I like his connective ability. Um, he competes on the glass. He's a willing screener. Like, it, kind of similar to how we were talking about Fleming earlier. Like, he plays mm-hmm. like the four. Um, they get crazy sometimes and let him play some five, you know, at ECU. But overall, he's just a very smooth guy. But I think he lacks a little bit of assertiveness. Mm-hmm. And I think that having gone through that last season and becoming like, one of the main options on ECU. And now that Javon Small is out, like he might end up being like the guy now. I think he will. At, yeah. At ECU. So I think that that's going to give him a good, or should give him a good boost of confidence and hopefully unlock some of the, you know, the rest of the tools in his game because he is a very intriguing player. Yeah. So Brandon Johnson, six foot eight, uh, technically considered a, a redshirt junior, which all this COVID year stuff is yeah. driving me insane. Like, there's so many guys. Where I'm like, all right, how did how is the school labeling this guy versus You're like 40 years what old? Go home. <laughs> hey, yeah, well, Brandon Johnson's not that old. He's not no, a. He's uh, not, no. Yeah, not a. Uh, oh gosh, who is? I can't remember the guy's name. The guy who was on Kansas and Illinois and eight other schools. Uh, I thought you were talking about Nunji for a second. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love Nunji. Uh, I love so, Nunji. So Brandon Johnson, uh, 12 point, three points per game, 8.1 rebounds, 1.9 assists, 0.9 steals, and 0.7 blocks, 43.9 from the field, uh, 33.3% from three, 74.6% from the free throw line. It is one of those things where, yeah, on paper, you can look at that and be like, oh, a six foot eight guy who like does everything, sign me up. I, I get your reservations to a point because I do think that like, yeah, like you mentioned that UCF game and that game, he scored 12 points, but he took 13 shots and like, he had a game against Memphis where it was, you know, seven or uh, against Houston where it was like seven points on eight shots. And like, yeah some of the, some of the games against good competition weren't great against Cincinnati, two points on five shots, Memphis, he had 15 points, but he took 13 shots. Like there's just things that come up where it's like, ah, game to game. You don't, you don't always know what you're, what you're getting with Brandon Johnson. And I think he's more like solid than good athletically. Like for a guy who's six foot eight, like you see that statistical profile and it's like, Oh man, like this guy seems like he makes a ton of plays and whatever. And like, it's a little bit more out of savvy 
than out of just like, oh, he can do whatever he wants on a basketball court. Exactly. And yeah. that that makes the the translation a little bit tricky because if you are going to be a little bit more feel oriented, usually like the feel has to be super, super high. And I'm not sure it's that high on defense. I think on offense, he's like really figuring some stuff out as a passer. And I thought down the stretch, like he was making some excellent reads and he was getting really creative with how you yeah. pass from the top of the key. Um, his shot got a lot better. I'm really leaning in with Brandon Johnson. So he's a guy that like I have sort of just on the, on the fringes of my top 60, he'll be, he'll be top 80 by the time I, I kind of eventually finalize the board. I would imagine. Um, I'm buying the late bloomer aspect. So he was a guy that like, wasn't a stellar high school prospect was like a role player for his Juco team. Wasn't really good during his sophomore year at ECU. And then like last year was actually good. So I'm yeah. hoping that like he's confident, he's figured out how to shoot. Football was his main sport for a long time. And I always think there that's like kind of like that an untapped sense. development area when it's like, oh, he's coming from football. Like he said, he played quarterback. Down. No, he was like a defensive. No. He was, I believe, a guard. I think I wrote down a positioning for it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. He was like a lineman. He was big. And like part of getting into basketball was that he started to lose weight. He was a defensive end and a right tackle. Okay. Um, so I'm hoping too, that that's maybe some of it. Like maybe he like shuts some baby fat. Maybe he's a little bit quicker. Like there could be some upside in that department, but I think just the massive shooting leap in terms of percentage and volume that he went under last year that like, if there's one more of those in there, then he's a real prospect. Like if it's a shot you know, looks good, like the, the, the motion looks good. Yeah. So he was 21% from three and 57% from the free throw line during I guess what was technically his redshirt freshman season at East Carolina. And then last year went from 21% to 33% from three, but the volume went from 0.5 a game to 4.4 a game. And then yeah. the free throw uh, percentage went from 57.5 to 74.6. So just getting way, way better at, at shooting the basketball. And with his size and his feel, if the feel takes another step and the shot just keeps getting better, like, I, I think then we're working with a guy that, that gets an NBA cup of coffee. Um, there's just not a lot of room for backsliding. Like if the shot isn't any better then it's just like, all right, you're just like a good yeah. power forward. And then, then it gets a little dicey. No, I, I totally agree. And you know, when I'm, he's confident and that's what's, mm -hmm. that's, what's good too. Right. Like, even though he was like a very streaky shooter, he never shied away from it. And the coach like still told him to, to go out and do it too so yeah. you know hopefully another like you're saying hopefully another off season where he's like probably going to be like the de facto guy with small transferring out going to oklahoma mm -hmm. you know i i hope you're right because he was a guy that you know like you said we were talking about a lot last year and again hopefully i'm hope i need to probably stray away from that anchoring bias because again i was i was there to watch taylor hendricks and said oh cool like i get to watch brandon johnson too mm -hmm. and it was like Taylor Hendricks, you're awesome. <laughs> that was yeah. pretty much the extent of it. Yeah, I, I think a big part of it is just like this is a kid that had one Division three school and three JUCOs that were into him three years ago. It's so like the yeah, point A to true. point B is crazy for him. And like mm -hmm. you were right about the confidence. I, I got to talk to Brandon Johnson for the article. And like that was a big thing he said was just like my teammates and coaches were so like they were so helpful for him just because it was like oh man like i can make a mistake and that's fine like i can i yeah. can keep shooting i if i have a turnover that's all right um really want to see that keep going he did he does have like a real like lunch pail kind of attitude to him like everything mm -hmm. he talked about was very just like i'm just i'm working on this i want to play hard or whatever like he seems very no frills which i think is a good helpful that. attitude to have so yeah, I, I think he's gonna I think he's gonna take another step this year and I'm I'm hoping he does. Uh who else was that kind of another guy that, that stood out for you here? So we can kind of group these three in here. Yeah. So out of these three, like who's the one that you're like, I think this guy has the best shot? Andrew Rohde. I okay. think yeah, I, I like him. Like, does he, he um, is, there is he with him. Is he an Austin Reeves disciple? You know Ooh, what I mean? Okay. Like a little, he's got a little bit of that to him where the shot always feels like it's going to go in. Yeah. You know, when he, when he puts it up, it feels like it's automatic. I love the move to Virginia. I think that that's, that that's going to be good for him. What I'm interested though, with the level up in competition, because obviously like he was able to do essentially whatever he wanted. Um, yeah. 
Do you feel like he's going to try to slide to being strictly off guard, or do you think Virginia is going to try to let him do like some Ty Jerome a little bit? Of- that's a that's an interesting question, and it's something I've been I've been like thinking about his role, yeah, way more than like almost any other college player, which is such a bizarre statement. It's like him and like some of the Duke guards, where I'm just like, wait a minute, what is going to happen? Next what week? are you going to do? Because it's like where like how they use him is like that might be the most like make or break decision for a basketball mm-hmm. pro like for the outcome of a player that yeah. a basketball program has is how is Virginia going to use Andrew Rody which again it sounds really weird when you're like where did this guy play like what's his name mm-hmm. he's going to Virginia okay whatever like there's a lot of implications depending on how the offense Virginia uses which is never really been like at the forefront of offensive innovation, right? Like they're, they're good program, right? But it's not like you go to Virginia because you want to develop your offensive game. Right. So yeah, I'm kind of curious on, on how that's going to look. Yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting. Um, So he played at St. Thomas last year um, and he scored 17.1 points. 3.7 3.7 rebounds, 3.6 assists to 2.2 turnovers. So it's 6-6, like can really sling the ball. 1.7 mm-hmm. steals per game, 0.1 blocks. One of those guys who like kind of like Tucker DeVries in the sense that like he shot like 32% from three as a freshman and you watch the tape and you're like, nah, he's better than that. Like you're just like, yeah. like it's like the easiest, like uh, there's like, there's like one or two guys every year where like you just see the three point shot and you see the percentage and you're like, this is the easiest prediction in the world to make is that mm-hmm. like, he's a better shooter than this percentage. He took a lot of difficult ones, takes him from NBA, tons of stuff off movement, tons of stuff off the dribble um, was really like a point guard for them last year. But I put him in this wing group because that's like who he's going to have to guard at the next level. Like he's not quick enough to cover ones. Mm-hmm. Like a guy like Trent Masner at Western Illinois, who was a really good athlete last year, like blew by him consistently. Um, but yeah, to your point, like, his versatility in a way like almost could potentially bite him because it's like, we could just use you as a spot up guy. We could just use you as a runoff screens yep. guy, or like you could be the lead guard. Like you could be the key. Clark to the Reese Beekman here. Like we <laughs> might run it through you. Liam McNeely is like kind or not Liam McNeely. Uh, Isaac McNeely. Is that the other guard that they have on Virginia? Ooh, um, you're putting me on the spot, man. I have to double check. Isaac, Isaac McNeely. That's what it was. Isaac. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, he is like kind of a combo guard can really play. So it's like, okay, well then if those guard spots are taken, are you playing him at the three? If you're playing him at the three, do you worry about the fact that like he was a bad rebounder when playing in a really small conference and like, he's never going to block shots and he's pretty ground bound. Like I have no idea what really is going to happen here. And it's why I put him like a little bit lower. And it's like one of those things where look at the end of the day, this kid's six foot six, he can really shoot it. He has really good feel. He knows how to use his length on defense. I think that makes him a viable long-term prospect. I am very hesitant to be like, oh yeah, next year, like he's going to make the leap, especially when he's transferring up from a very small conference to one that has loads of great athletes in it. He's doing it on a roster that's kind of crowded. So I'm very hesitant, but I think he's super interesting. I'm with you, man. Like I think the, the, the aura that is around him for those who like dive deep into call. Like you and I, we, we know people, especially in the Twitter verse or the X verse. Mm-hmm. I haven't got to make the funny comments about the Twitter. <laughs> yeah. You're yet. still, so this still is getting my, caught up to speed on that. Yeah. Yeah. This is my first go around with it. So, mm-hmm. um, on the app formerly known as Twitter, like we mm-hmm. both have had people hit us up about this guy. And it's like, I, I don't know why I don't want to buy in with the level of competition that he's playing. Yeah. I got to see, I got to see it elsewhere. And I'm glad that he's challenging that. Like I like it's going to be for the best because there's no way that he was going to be able to stay and, 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 and convince people that he could go pro with where he was playing, man. Like he had to make a move. Don't know if I love the move to Virginia. I'm kind of curious. Like I'll have to go back and look and see like where else he was getting offers from. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that he did make that decision because you got you got to be able to prove it. Yeah, the Summit League was like a league I watched like 
kind of an embarrassing amount of last year. Like I watched way more summer league, like uh, summit league games than I probably should have. Is like a big, a, big like Sam Hashtredder guy myself. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like it's I, it's a weird leak. It's like on paper, it's like oh yeah, there's like a lot of talent. Like there's Max Acemus, there's uh, like Connor Vanover. It's like a it's like yeah. the island of misfit toys where it's like here's this guard max ace miss he's like five foot ten and he scores all the time here's connor vanover he's seven three and can kind of shoot here's grant nelson he's like the best athlete in college basketball like the connective tissue is all over the place like you don't know what you're getting uh so excited for Trenton alabama Masters, too, by like, the way. Said, yeah like oh it's gonna be a fun team like it yeah. was just such an odd league that like there's really good stars for the college basketball game in that league, but like, there's just so many guys that you watch and it's like, this is not great college basketball. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be a big adjustment. And he did well in those games against Oral Roberts for the most part, which was like yeah. the best team in their league. Like wasn't super efficient though. And like, he wasn't super efficient when they played Creighton. I, I, yeah, I, I just have my doubts. Like part of me is just like, I, I think it's going to take a minute and that's fine. He's got plenty of time. Yeah. Um, I think he's a long-term prospect. As I said in the article, I think yes. this is a guy for down the road with several O's, but I'm definitely, <laughs> definitely interested. If I could turn it to you for the next two guys, cause yeah. I know that you, that you like Zach Austin out of this, yes. out of this group quite a bit. Uh -huh. Him and Cedric Coward were kind of like, the, they were kind of hard watches, both. Okay. Like, even, yeah. And even Zach Austin, because Just, I, I the need, bad Zach I need, Austin games are are pretty bad. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm watching them and I'm like, okay, he's a little loose with the ball, but the form looks good. You know, mm -hmm. he's a bit of a chucker, but he can shoot off the bounce. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's like all these like diametrically opposed, like if you're looking at a color wheel, right. But instead it's like basketball comments, like he mm -hmm. has both like, opposing things that you could say about him with the way that he plays basketball. Um, the passive vision, the passing vision is there, um, but the execution isn't always there. like he's looking at the right thing, but like getting mm -hmm. the ball there, it was like a bit of a challenge in some of the games that I'm watching for him. So yeah. I'm interested on why he was like the guy that you had a little bit higher on the list, because mm -hmm. when I'm watching all these guys, I'm not going to lie, man, like, between coward and austin i'm like kind of eh, yeah 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 i, go either I get way that. here so i i like austin more because i think he at six seven like is an nba athlete and i think that's okay. like evident in how often he dunks i think it's evident in his defensive production average 2.1 blocks and 1.1 steals per game last season posted similar numbers the year before that um i do think he's a better shooter than the percentage indicates but unlike andrew road it's like roadie it's like more of a this is a bad percentage because you take some really bad shots, man. Like, yeah. So it gets a little bit tricky there. It's like it, there was a game where they played UNLV last year where like some of his teammates were so <laughs> mad at some of the threes <laughs> that he was taking. And it's like, ah, man. So there needs to be serious refinement. Um, he's got to be more consistent with how he passes. Um, he needs to be more discerning with his shot selection. Um, but this is an NBA athlete. Like this guy just moves, yeah. jumps, runs like a pro knows how to make a ton of plays on defense. I actually like his feel on that end. I love how he rotates yeah. to the rim has a great sense for helping from the weak side. Um, and if you looked at like the, so here, here it says I had last season was one of five players to register more than 35 dunks and 50 or more made threes. And like the other guy, like two of those guys were Kobe Brown and Taylor Hendricks. And I believe the Pretty other two, names were drew pember and someone that we're going to talk about in just a second before we preview the next part of the series okay. so uh yeah it's it's a really good mix to be in he lets it fly i really think it's just a matter of like can you figure out how to play a complementary role can you figure out how to like take the right shots pass up the bad ones and then like pass a little bit and if you can do that then like then you're a guy that can like go on an NBA court and at the very least, like not embarrass himself. So I think the other part of it is I love the school choice with Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has been cleaning up. I'm going like, to ask you about that. Yeah. Yeah. Capel has been cleaning up with just like getting these guys that transfer in and like have just janky odd production where it's like, Ooh, that those are kind of ugly numbers. And then all of a sudden they're just like fully formed basketball players. Um, 
he did really well in their European tour. I saw that he was like killing, killing teams over there. So that has me optimistic. I, I just think it's a matter of like making less mistakes. He needs to make less mistakes and he does need to take a step forward too. like his freshman and sophomore stats were like way too similar for my liking. Like there needs to be clear improvement somewhere. Yeah. Um, but I, th- I think Pittsburgh and like a change of scenery is exactly what he needs to do that. I, I, I think that that's fair, man. And like, I can't help, but when I watched him play, you remember like on, on Twitter when it was like the whole Hooper conversation, like, yeah. you know, who'd you rather have? Like, what's the definition of a Hooper and basketball player and all this stuff? Like Zach, Zach Austin is a Hooper. Like mm-hmm. he like textbook definition of it. And I think, you know, he does have the skill set that if he does rein some things in, like it won't be hard for the improvement to come because he, he can get to spots really well, yeah. you know, and he, and he has good, good touch on his shots. You know, it's just the shot selection needs a little bit of mm-hmm. uh, a little bit of help and just being a little bit more disciplined. But, you know, if, if you can hone those things in, like you're looking at a really good player for sure. Yeah, that's where I'm at. And I, I think it's going to be like, kind of like, like we said, with road, like it's going to be kind of one of those make or break transfer situations. Cause like Pittsburgh plays like a pretty serious disciplined brand of basketball and like if it's yeah. not like happening i don't think they're gonna be like well we've got to play him <laughs> like like they've yeah. done a really good job of getting talent on their roster over the last couple of years that like if he's if he's doing that kind of stuff they can just not play him so it'll be interesting i think i think he's gonna put it together though i'm, I'm optimistic uh so let's do cedric coward who is like i would say like maybe the most controversial uh addition of in these articles because i I so okay so part of what I said in this article and I'm gonna I'm gonna rehash kind of the line here is that um I think it's very easy I think you see a lot of people I'm like I don't want to like name names or like dump on anybody because that's like not what my sure. question is there's a lot of people that will blast out like a million names of players and be like, this guy has a chance this guy has a chance this guy's a mm-hmm. chance I think I think there is real value and like you can tell who's a little bit more serious about the scouting process when they pick and choose those players. Mm -hmm. So when I picked a guy who played in the big sky conference and scored less than 10 points per game, less than eight points per game uh, and played 22 minutes per game last season, I wanted it to be a guy that like I'm legitimately willing to kind of go out on a limb for. And and that's, Mm -hmm. and that's Cedric Howard. So, Howard was on a fantastic Eastern Washington team. They were like 16 and two in conference play last season. The Memphis Grizzlies have like their formula that they like to use for guys they draft, right? Where it's efficient field goal percentage over 57. Coward was 73 uh, out of his field goal percentage. Defensive rebound assist rate over 14. His defensive rebound rate was 20.4 assist rate 14.9. Block rates and steal rates, they like to see over two. His block rate was 3.5, steal rate was 2.1. So he checks all of these production boxes. He's six mm-hmm. foot six. He's very long. He moves really yes. well. He moves like a high major player. Um, it really just becomes a question about scalability. Uh, Eastern Washington, the last couple of years, for like people that aren't watching a ton of Eastern Washington, which is understandable if you're like a normal human being functioning in society. Uh, they play not these since really... Rodney Stuckey, right? Like, yeah, I <laughs> Rodney Stuckey went there. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So they play these big lineups. Like they play a lot of dudes that are like six, six and above. They all can handle the ball. It's a very like everybody kind of gets their turn sort of offense. Like it's very uh, democratic. Yep, yeah. yep. Everyone's getting their shots. Um, their two big players last year were Angelo Allegri, who I, I believe is on an exhibit 10 uh, with an NBA team, or he, I think he played summer league for something. He's, he's, he's going to be like an NBA or G league guy next season. Yeah. He's and getting then, sips of coffee. Yeah. Yep. And then steel Venters, who transferred up to Gonzaga. Those two guys are gone. So now mm-hmm. that kind of leading man role is open and it's not even a guarantee that they're going to fill it because like they could just keep doing what they're doing, which is like, we'll have like, five guys that score between nine and 15 points per game. Like they might just do that. Um, I think Coward's going to do it. And, and to go back to my point about like, you got to be careful about like who you, you know, 
put your put your weight behind like i said in the article i'm just going to read this i feel like scouting is like on the fringes is like jazz it's about the notes you uh don't play and the players you don't talk about i could throw a thousand guys and say they have a chance but that ruins the sanctity of putting your foot down and proclaiming i believe in this player i'm playing this note and i believe in cedric coward i think at some point whether it's this year or further down the road he's going to work himself into nba front office conversations i love the way that he just has a million ways to impact the game um I understand that the three point volume is really low. Um, he was a good three point shooter at the division three level, which is not like you don't want to like bang the table and be like, he made threes yeah. at division three, but, <laughs> but he did. And like, he, he shot a high percentage in college. I, I do think his shot is there. Um, really determined kid was able to come by some positive Intel on him. Um, interviewed him and was like blown away. He is mm. very, very serious about the game of basketball. I think I put in the article, he might be the most serious person I've ever interviewed in terms of like level of drive and just intensity in terms of how he talks about the game of basketball. There's a little bit of Andres Nocioni in him where it's just like every game, like he is playing as hard as possible to make life miserable for the other team in any way that he can. And there's some feel that goes with it. So coward, I get it. Like, this dude scored under eight points per game at Eastern Washington. He didn't start like maybe we're putting the cart way ahead of the horse by being like NBA teams are going to have conversations about this guy. I, I get it. But I, at the same time, I see a guy who is extremely conducive to winning, has good physical tools and yep. can just do whatever to impact the game. It has some vision too, man. Like, he so really he's does. not, he's not like just a, uh, a guy, like a, a well-built athlete, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Cause sometimes we just look at dudes and be like, okay, like you, you play a professional sport, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But he has like that innate feel too, which again, you know, in that Eagles, uh, Terry and style of play in Eastern Washington, like some guys who have some real talent. And, and when I'm watching him play, like I, he's not a guy that you watch on film and be like, oh, okay, he's like scoring less than eight points per game. Like he has real impact on the game. My thing is, is like, I think he gets into times where he like forces the issue a little bit too much, which hearing the interview, yeah. it makes sense. Right. Because mm-hmm. like how intense you're saying that he's talking, like he plays intense. Right. So I think sometimes he can kind of force it a little bit too strong, but you know, the, the old saying, right? Like I would rather have a guy who has a high motor and tell him to dial it down than a guy who has no motor and try to ramp him up. Right. So he is like the example of that, that type of saying that we see, all the time he's not afraid of contact you know he i think he actually encourages it a little bit Mm. at times too i i actually did have him above zach austin on on my list right yeah so Mm -hmm. because again like he he feels like this feel uh, is much better yeah the the feel is right there like as you just said yeah yeah i i think it's like a real just like the film is just like he's the most has that dog in him player in college yes. basketball the analytics are unbelievable like just like the basic advanced numbers are tremendous and just talking to him it's like oh this is like a smart kid who cares a lot about yeah. being great at basketball um so yeah i'm i'm buying i understand anybody that is like let's wait two more years like i i completely get it but I, yeah, I, th- I think he's going to find a way. I don't know that it's this year. Like I think, and like, there's a chance he's just like a great college player and that's what he is. And then he gets his bag, you know, somewhere else at, he might be that. I think that's possible. Um, but I do think there's a lot more upside and like the way I ran it, I think, I think it was Corey that I was texting. I was like, if you had to like put a gun to my head and you were like, who's the next Javante green, like who's a guy that is at a small school right now that you think could make an NBA roster that like nobody is even thinking about. I think I would say mm-hmm. Zedric Coward and maybe I'm just like way like head over heels for a guy that like is fun to watch. And I'm laying into my aesthetic biases of a guy who's all over the place on the court and making stuff happen. But that's, that's kind of where there's I nothing I, wrong with having, having fun with the process either. For right? sure. Like, you, yeah. Yeah. And, and with these interviews and stuff, like the players that we talk to, man, like you have a tendency to kind of like, you know, might be a little bit more hyperbolic here, but like you fall in love mm. with like the personality of some of these yeah. dudes too. And that kind of like pushes your like, uh, 
your 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 opinion of them a little more because like how you how you're hearing them talk about the game like you start seeing it and you hear the words that they're telling you like while you're mm-hmm. watching them play and it's just like oh man like this like whole new level of connection happens yeah when you're when sure. you're evaluating a player and I, I think your points about him being like over aggressive are totally fair like it shows up on offense at times with like turnovers mm-hmm. Uh, and defense, it's like the fouling. Like on defense, yeah. it's a lot of the like I sold out for a block or like I just ran right into a dude and clobbered him. And like that really has to be refined. Is like he grows into a bigger role because it's like something that like I ran into a lot this year. Like during the pre-draft process, is I talk to guys and they'd be like, "I wish I could have played harder on defense. But my team needed me to stay out of foul trouble." And it's yeah. like that is really important when you are your mm-hmm. teams like go to guys staying out of foul troubles. Like that that stuff is something like he does seriously have to rein in if we're talking about him playing a bigger role because you're not getting nba attention if you're just a role player it is school yeah. against in washington you gotta be you gotta be dylan jones you gotta be the gotta guy be the you gotta guy. do everything so um real quick let's talk about just brief preview of the next five guys that we've got uh for the next no stone and turn win group so we will have um couple of these guys we've got sort of interviews in the books for so we've got oh uh by way of northern colorado playing at tennessee next season dalton connect uh, i love tennessee oh dalton connect rocks uh yes. interviewed him the other day good kid i'm a fan uh one of those just like dunks and threes guys like he was he was yes. the other guy who met that query earlier uh jameer watkins from florida okay State. so yep still trying to make something happen on, on the interview front there. We'll, we'll see. Um, they're like traveling. They've got all sorts of stuff going on at Florida state. So, um, Josh Udige, who is at coastal Carolina and is transferring to Utah state next season. I'm going to um, look him up. He, yeah, he's much more of a theoretical guy. He's, he's my like Cedric Howard, uh, Rashir Fleming kind of guy for this group. Gotcha. It's like, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that needs to come along, but I think there's a chance that it could like he, he's that guy. Um, Love the name though. Very oh, good basketball name. game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Johnny O'Neill, who is at American university and is transferring to Santa Clara next year. Santa Clara. They, had they good luck. Up. Yep. Yep. And uh, Johnny O'Neill is uh, I'm going to, I'm going to reveal a scoop right now. So Johnny O'Neill was listed mm. at six foot nine. Um, talked to uh Ryan Majry, an assistant there. He got to campus, they measured him, and he's six ten and a half in shoes. So they wow. were like, Oh, okay. like we thought he was gonna be six nine in shoes, and he is like a full inch and a half taller than we expected him to be. Um, tremendous defender, really good three-point shooter. And the last guy I just spoke to today, uh BJ Freeman, who was at Milwaukee last year, um, had like a good start to the year. And then if you look at his stats from January 1st through the end of the year, he averaged like 22 points, six rebounds and four assists down the stretch. So he's the guy who just had like a crazy, crazy stretch to the season to to finish up. Um, Yeah. I talked to him today. Real interesting, real interesting guy, really cool story. So that's going to be the next win group. So there's your, your spoiler alert. So for part three, that's who we're going to be kind of diving into. Um, Steven, any, uh, any final closing thoughts on this one here? Well, man, like I said, I, it makes me feel good when you name a couple of players that I know, and then I'm mm-hmm. always excited to dive into the ones that, that I get to learn, that I get to learn about, you know, just like the audience does, man. So, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's great to be back, man. It's great to see that you're still churning out these interviews and uh, with players, with coaches, you know, people associated with the program diving deep man it motivates me i'm excited to be back man and uh i can't wait to read the next piece for sure sounds good well as always we appreciate you guys tuning in make sure you're following us on social media at Stephen g hoops and at bound boards make sure you're subscribed to the no ceilings nba podcast feed make sure you're subscribed to no ceilings nba.com for all of our written content which is really about to start gearing up so exciting times over at no ceilings so make mm. sure you're plugged in over there until next time we'll see you guys later much love y'all